Hi, everyone. My name is Alita Cass. I'm the Vice President for Strategic Initiatives at the Federalist Society and Director of the Freedom of Thought Project. Welcome to today's Federalist Society discussion series. I want to welcome you all to the fourth event in our discussion series on free speech and social media. This afternoon, July 1st, we will be discussing antitrust and market power questions related to digital platforms and social media. This series is part of the Federalist Society's new initiative to address emerging challenges to freedom of thought, conscience, and expression in a variety of key sectors, including our law schools, law firms, corporate America, and the tech sector. We are very pleased to have Judge Katsis moderate this discussion series. Judge Katsis was appointed to the DC Circuit in December, 2017. After graduating from Harvard Law School, he served as law clerk to Judge Edward Becker on the Third Circuit and to Justice Clarice Thomas on the Supreme Court. For 16 years, he practiced at Jones Day where he specialized in appellate and complex civil litigation. He has also served as Assistant Attorney General for the Civil Division of the Justice Department and is acting Associate Attorney General and as Deputy Counsel to the President. I'll be turning this over to Judge Katsis to introduce today's panel want to note that we will be offering CLE credit for today's event. Um, please remember to uh, see the registration page and write down the verification codes that Judge Katsis will be announcing as moderator. With that, thanks everyone for joining us. Judge Katsis, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, as Alita said, uh, this is the fourth of a six part series. Um, Prior panels have examined the First Amendment rights of both the social media platforms and individual users on the platforms. We've examined uh, protections for the platforms afforded by Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, and also the possibility of regulating the platforms either as common carriers or places of public accommodation videos of all those panels are available on the website, on the FEDSOC website. Today's topic is antitrust. Traditionally, conservatives and libertarians have been skeptical about the aggressive use of antitrust to regulate the competitive conduct of large firms, particularly the aggressive use of Section 2 of the Sherman Act to police unilateral conduct, <laughs> excuse me, as opposed to trade restraining agreements. Recall, for example, Judge Bork's monumental book, The Antitrust Paradox. To what extent does big tech warrant a different approach? Justice Thomas recently described as unprecedented the concentrated control of so much speech in the hands of so few private parties. How, if at all, should antitrust address that problem? Now, one subsidiary question is defining the markets in which dominant platforms like Facebook, Twitter, and Google operate. Some have argued that there are no market transactions between the platforms and individual users who, after all, use the platform services for free. Others see market abuses in seemingly conventional antitrust terms. Consider, for example, the allegation that Google leverages market power in the internet search services market to gain a competitive advantage in other markets, say for travel services or whatever. And still others see larger problems with Facebook, Twitter, and Google now serving as gatekeepers for speech in political markets and as possibly engaged in viewpoint suppression of political speech, which all agree would be unconstitutional if done by the government. Recently, both the federal government and the states filed major antitrust lawsuits against Facebook and Google. At first glance, the suits appear focused on more traditional antitrust theories like monopoly leveraging in commercial markets rather than on broader concerns about viewpoint discrimination in markets for political speech. Two of our panelists have been involved in that litigation and one 
was its principal intellectual architect. A few days ago, a district court dismissed the FTC's suit against Facebook. I can't comment on that decision for obvious reasons, but our panelists are not so constrained. Our panelists, uh, Dina Srinivasan is a fellow with the Thurmond Arnold Project at Yale University where she researches and analyzes the economics of new technology markets. Her articles laid the groundwork for historic antitrust lawsuits now pending against Facebook and Google. The antitrust case against Facebook, published in 2019, argues that Facebook's surveillance project policies reflect market power. Why Google dominates advertising markets, published in 2020, argues that Google has monopolized online advertising markets, and she represents a coalition of states pressing that view in court. She graduated from Yale Law School where she was an Olin Fellow. John Yun is an Associate Professor of Law at the Antonin Scalia School, School of Law at George Mason University, and also the Director of Economic Education at the Global Antitrust Institute. Before joining Scalia Law, he was an Acting Deputy Assistant Director in the Antitrust Division of the Bureau of Economics at the Federal Trade Commission. He's also taught economics at Georgetown, Emory, and Georgia Tech. He received his BA in Economics at UCLA and his PhD in Economics at Emory. Ashley Keller is a partner at Keller Lenker, where he handles complex antitrust, securities, patent contract, and mass tort cases. He previously worked as a hedge fund analyst, and he co-founded the litigation finance firm of Gurchin Keller Capital, which became the world's largest private investment manager focused on legal and regulatory risk. He graduated from the University of Chicago Law School and Business School, and he served as a law clerk for Judge Richard Posner on the Seventh Circuit and for Justice Anthony Kennedy on the Supreme Court. He too is involved in the pending antitrust litigation against Google. Um, get your pencils out if you want. Dina, the floor is yours. Thank you, Judge Katsas. It, uh, it's a really a pleasure to, to be here today and to be talking about this. Um, I'll just sort of give a short summary of, of why I wrote the Facebook paper in the first place and what I was seeing and really thinking in response. So I was in the advertising industry. I graduated law school and decided to, to go into back into business instead of law. I thought it would allow me to manage family work, life balance a little bit better. And I was in the advertising industry. And one of the things that you note or that I noted when I was in the advertising industry is that as time moved forward, companies were extracting more and more data from consumers. And the, the, the holy grail from an advertising perspective was if a company could extract permission from consumers to conduct a type of surveillance across, uh, on them across the entire internet. So not just on their own property, but on the business websites of millions of other sites across the internet, such that if you wake up in the morning and you go to the New York Times and you read an article, I can now make a record of what you're reading and I have permission to do that. And I have permission to actually keep a record that is um, that is correlated with your real identity. And I was watching Facebook try to extract this term from consumers since about 2005 or 2006, maybe. And every time it tried to do this, consumers would revolt back and Facebook would have to retreat in the market. And it looked 
to me, like competition was working because it was restraining this company from extracting this term from consumers. Fast forward to 2014, and um, you know, competition in the social network market had decreased over time. Competitors had exited the market. Google was now competing with Facebook. Google exited the market in June of 2014. And that very same month, Facebook flipped the switch and said, if you want to keep using Facebook, you're now going to consent to this term of trade where I get to conduct this surveillance on you buy your real identity across the internet. And I can then actually use that data for all these, all the following reasons, which include, of course, delivering more targeted advertising. To me, this looked like a quintessential market, market power antitrust um, story. And I thought the harm that was being extracted was not a price, but actually a price in terms of privacy and data. This was also a time that um, maybe it was in 2012, actually, that sort of the Snowden revelations came out about the alleged prison program with the NSA that was supposedly tapping into data belonging to Facebook and Google and other big tech companies. And I just thought this was really interesting, like these different moving parts of, um, you know, I, di I didn't buy the narrative that we were seeing in the media that this was something that consumers liked and consumers consented to. At the same time um, in the media, but also sort of um, within academia, the narrative was that we might need to change antitrust law to solve market power problems when it came to big tech companies. And um, I, didn't, I didn't think that was the case. I was sort of a big fan of Bork when I read him in law school, because I thought that the cases before that, several of them presented um, problems and didn't make economic sense. And I have deep respect for antitrust laws coupling with economic theory. And so, um, and so I, I, uh, I thought that it, it would make sense to tell the story of, no, we can, we can use traditional consumer welfare framework and we can use antitrust law as it currently stands to defend, um, uh, to correct these wrongs and defend, you know, American people when it comes to this specific type of economic harm. So that was really the story behind behind the Facebook paper. Should I keep going, Judge Katzis? Or you have five more minutes if you like to use them. Sure. So. Um, I started with this theory and then went back and, and, you know, started down the rabbit hole of research. And the more I went down this rabbit hole, the more interesting it was. And the more that it confirmed this, this, this theory of market entry competing on privacy. So in 2004, we had MySpace. MySpace really sucked from a privacy and data perspective. And Facebook's entry into that market was strategically to compete on better privacy levels. And so that was the, the first sort of piece of the story. And, um, and that, makes, that makes rational sense because, because when people want to communicate, if you provide them higher levels of privacy, they open up more and they tend to communicate more. So if you're a business that's competing sort of as a communications tool or as a communications network, you want to provide higher levels of privacy so that consumers come and they can trust that as a communications channel. As time moved forward, um, various companies tried to, tried to uh, decrease privacy and weren't able to do so before market because of market forces. I think the first example when it came to Facebook was a program called Beacon that it launched maybe in 2006. You would um, go to a you know a third party website. Maybe you're shopping for electronics, and you check out with an with an electronic, and the site gives you a pop up and it says, "Hey, do you is it okay that we share this information on Facebook? Can we share this information with Facebook?" And consumers were really not happy about this. Um, they said no. They wrote letters. They formed um, groups. They, they really made their voice heard when it came to their privacy online with respect to third-party websites. Um, Facebook ended up trying to do something. So they retreated and they 
tried to sort of um, do the same thing through a different program a few years later. And again, consumers were very upset about this. And remember, the backdrop here is that there's a lot of competition in the market. And um, one of the things that the firm did is it instituted a democratic process. It promised its users, hey, you can really trust us moving forward with your data and privacy because what we're gonna do moving forward is we're gonna let you vote on it. And unless, um, unless it passes through this democratic process of our users, we're not going to degrade your privacy moving forward. So that policy was adopted perhaps in 2011, but don't hold me, don't hold me on that date exactly. Um, later it was withdrawn and Again, it wasn't until Google exited the market in 2014 that Facebook extracted this, this permission from consumers. From an antitrust perspective, this was the story of consumer welfare. So this was the story of precisely the monopoly rent that's being extracted in, the, in these economic transactions. Um, I, you know, I sort of, um, well, actually I won't go there. Uh, in terms of the antitrust theory of liability, I thought, well, we can think about this in a number of different ways. But the way that I thought about it, and you know, sort of what made the most sense to me is that this is a market with network effects. This is the market that is subject to tipping. And we know that antitrust law says, if you're a monopolist and you get there through competition on the merits, that's fine but anything that falls short of competi competition on the merits is not fine. And the more I researched, the more I thought that the story that the facts told was one of sort of bait and switch, one of sort of a pattern or a long sort of course of conduct of deception in the market to get consumers to choose your social network um, and to trust you when it came to privacy and then later flip the switch. And I thought that this looked pretty deceptive and it didn't look like honest competition. And I thought that that type of conduct might trigger the anti-competitive conduct piece of, um, of antitrust, of the antitrust framework. Thank you. Uh, John, you're up. Thank you, Judge Katzis. And, uh... I really actually enjoyed hearing Dina's research into Facebook. And, you know, this question of privacy on these platforms, I think it's something I definitely share as well. And it's something we all share. And so the, the issue for me is how do we get to better privacy policies? What's the right path um, accepting that there's misbehavior in the market? And so, you know, um, there's really no doubt that privacy and antitrust are on a collision course. That's uh, without a doubt, um, and perhaps uh, partly due to a, a number of factors going on, um, but that's where we are today. And fundamental to that is this idea that uh, many of these platforms, such as Facebook, is a zero price, price platform, right? And so what's the exchange when it's a zero price? And you know, the, the common refrain is, well, we're the exchange, we are the product. And I, I'm, I, I think of that uh, Charlton Heston movie, uh, Soylent and Green. I don't know if anyone's seen that. Where at the very end, he says, Soylent and Green are people. That's what it's about. So uh, bad, bad reference, but I often think of that. Well, so I think to understand this, what is the exchange? To some degree, there's some truth that we are the exchange, uh, but it's really our attention that they're interested in. And so their intention is how they ultimately monetize uh, their platforms and so through advertising. And so how do they get better attention? Well, a number of ways, one of which is better content and better advertising. And so how do you get that? Well, uh, better data about that person and whether you're tracking them on your site or as Dina mentioned across the internet, they want that data about you ultimately to monetize your attention so that, uh, that um, you know, per, per hour of view, you're going to um, really click or, or view more ads. So, so there's some truth to that notion, but really the exchange is one of which is that we get something of interest um, in exchange for our attention. I think that's, to me, uh, maybe not a big difference, but a, a refinement that's worth mentioning. 
Um, so this is then moved to the idea, well, privacy is the price that we pay, right? The data that we give up is the price to the access to the network. And it is, that's not that it's wrong. I mean, there is a truth to that notion, right? Because um, in some sense, our data, our attention is what we're, we're giving up. But I think, you know, we need to be uh, a little bit more discerning about that if, if we are going to use it as policy. And so um, this notion of privacy as the payment um, really has two strands, one of which is uh, privacy is a fundamental right that individuals have. And so it's almost akin to a natural right. And so anything that affects that in the marketplace, whether it affects competition or not per se, is something that antitrust should be worried about. Uh, this came up during Google DoubleClick in 2007. There were a number of petitions to, to block the acquisition, not based off of competitive concerns, but through privacy concerns. Uh, Facebook WhatsApp also had a, a number of petitions that were along these lines. And so, you know, this notion, uh, it's, it's interesting, but it, it has less currency. I think the more uh, popular notion is that privacy really is the price. It's akin to a quality adjusted price where with more market power, just like we would expect higher prices, we expect lower levels of privacy based off of that. And again, it, as a hypothesis, there's nothing wrong with that. And I think for certain markets that be, can be quite true. But um, in terms of, of my focus, is that a good presumption for us to have? Um, and so uh, one of the issues is both on conceptual issue as well as an empirical issue. So, so what's the con conceptual issues with that paradigm? One of which is, do consumers really make decisions based off of privacy? Um, you know, certainly they say they do, but their behavior in various studies show that it's not always so clear. And this is the famous privacy paradox. Now, there's literature that shows it goes both ways. So it's not as if it's always cleanly that consumers don't care, nor is it always cleanly the other way. And so there's a mixture there. And so there's some uncertainty that consumers are really on the margin making decisions based off of privacy. And, and to me, it's really a question of control, right? We're willing to give up privacy for our Fitbit and maybe our Apple watches. We're giving up a lot of sensitive health information about our lifestyle. But if they're using it in the right way in the right exchange, I think a lot of people at least are, are quite satisfied with that exchange. Um, but it's only when it's mis misused or, or they lack control, I think, where there's some, some unhappiness. Same thing goes with with uh, sort of location tracking apps such as maps and, and, and guidance. Uh, those are very important for a smartphone and, and you know, that's exchange a lot of people wanna make, but you know, obviously you don't want your data of where you've been and, and where you're going to be something that they, that they use in, a, in an inappropriate way. So some of this seems to be explained by control, uh, which again, to suggest privacy is important, but uh, some of it is, isn't that they're unwilling to give it up it's just how are these platforms using it and is it very transparent and maybe it's not in a lot of ways. And so, so yeah, that's, that's one element in which this conceptual idea of privacy as a price, uh, there's just a complexity to that that I think we should, we should uh, look at. The second complexity I wanna talk about is um, this idea that, well, privacy, how is it, do you get less privacy? Well, they have more data about you. And so what does more data mean? More data means more users, more users means more data, and this kind of creates this market power, and this is how privacy data and, and are related as, as sort of a, a measure of price. So, so one issue with that, it, it, to me, this isn't a standard network effect, uh, the classic network effect that I think Tina, uh, Dina was talking about network effects. And this data version of it, I think, is a little bit different. Um, the idea here is that if you have more data, well, how do you get more users? Well, you have to have better content better, something better to bring the users on. I mean, the proposition is more data means more users. And so it must be offering some type of value to those users. And when there's more users, obviously there's gonna be more advertisers. So that, that seems to be a, a dimension that's a little bit different. Um, and additionally, it just doesn't translate into more users automatically. Unlike price, when you raise price all else equal, you have more revenue. That's quite good for profitability for a firm. But when you have more data, that doesn't translate into more revenue. It needs to be uh, processed in some way to, to add value. And that's where firms can compete off that. Some firms can compete better with the data than, than others. 
And that's a dimension of competition that I think is, is worth at least considering. So because of these conceptual uh, complexities, I would say, uh, I think the straightforward idea of data as a price, there's a more texture to it. It's not that it's, it's completely wrong, um, but I think we should appreciate that it's a little bit different from price per se. The second issue that I have is that this is really ultimately an empirical question, just like price and market power is an empirical issue that uh, time after time um, economics has shown that price is related with market power is the same thing with privacy. And so there actually hasn't been a ton done. Um, now there can be specific instances where um, Dina uh, mentions uh, Facebook, uh, but there could be other markets where that's not so true. So what I think we should be cautious of is a presumption that more market power means less privacy. And I don't think that question has been explored that much in depth. Um, a colleague of mine, uh, James Cooper, uh, we go back to graduate school. We just put a, our, uh, our first paper together um, and it's on this question of empirical uh, evidence of privacy and uh, market power. And we, we get data from, from the Android app store uh, we get some privacy grades from Carnegie Mellon University. We do it for desktop as well. And, and just long story short, no one wants to hear uh, that paper, but it doesn't show a very clean relationship between market power and privacy. Um, and again, this doesn't mean that privacy is not a problem. This doesn't mean that specific markets don't have that relationship, but as a presumption, is something that I think there should be caution against because a number of digital reports as well as um, the House report really base uh, some of their, their recommendations off of this presumption and perhaps, you know, with, with earnest and, and, and with goodwill. But I think we should explore these presumptions because ultimately, if we want better privacy, I think we need the right approach. And if we think breaking up companies and, and more competition means more privacy, I don't think that that's so far what the evidence will show. Um, I'm all for more privacy. How do we get there? And so, you know, that can be a point of discussion today, but, you know, real quick, I would think that things such as consumer protection is the better avenue if we are really looking for better privacy, and I think we should be. And so that to me is, is more important, the transparency, giving more controls to users, such as Apple's recent update to their iOS. I think that that created some friction between Apple and, and Facebook. But I think giving consumers more choice and more transparency and ease of use, I think that's really important as well. Just saying, oh, it's out there, go read it and buried in some web page. That's, that's a much different story than having a control that's really accessible to users and easy to understand. I think that's a, a major important, important difference between the two. And I think that's where it's more valuable and just the final comment, if you go to the FTC's website about privacy violations, I did this a couple of months ago. It's, I guess I just do things like that. And I wanted to see who's violating privacy. You, you have your big name firms, but you really have a lot of these smaller no-name people that I was, I, I've never heard of them and they're violating privacy left and right and it's in very uh, egregious ways. Um, and so the, the, the punchline is, is, is that really honing in on market power only as a solution to privacy problems, I think it's an inc incomplete idea. It can be right in certain instances, but I think it's more important to, to get the larger context. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you, Judge. I'm not as creative as Dina and John, so I decided to organize my remarks by just going straight to the three questions that the Federalist Society posed, and I'll try and tick through them in the 10 minutes that I have. So the first question posed, I think is the most important one. How should we think about the behavior of social media and quote, big tech and quote, in regulating public discourse? And I've got a pretty simple answer. We should be alarmed. We should be stirred to action. I think that big tech is a big problem when it comes to public discourse. And I think that because of the intersection of three different observations that I think by themselves, any one of which wouldn't be sufficient to call this a five alarm fire, but because I think that they're happening all at the same time, I think we have to act uh, and antitrust can be the way that we act to solve the problem. So the first observation is probably the least compelling or the least profound. And I think Dina did a great job laying this out and her research does more of it, but it's big tech has market power. 
I don't want to get into some small, significant, non-transitory increase in price technical definition of the market. We can do that in the Q&A if you want to. But I think we all have a pretty strong intuition that big tech has market power or monopoly power over the dissemination and consumption of information, of content, of viewpoints. They control key access points to get information out to the public. So producers of information have to go through big tech and consumers of information have to go through big tech. Now, that by itself would be a concern, but not necessarily a huge problem. The theoretical concern would be that when you have a monopoly, you charge the monopoly price and that's gonna reduce output. And as a consequence of that, that means that there's gonna be less content than there would be in a free and unfettered market economy because that price competition would lower the cost of producing content and there'd be more viewpoints disseminating in the marketplace of ideas. And we all obviously care about the marketplace of ideas and less ideas in that marketplace is not healthy for Republican government, but by itself, there'd still be plenty of information flowing in the marketplace of ideas. And so I don't view the monopoly power in itself as the biggest issue associated with big tech and public discourse. But that sort of leads to the second observation that I hope is a little bit more profound. And it's one that alarms me a great deal when coupled with the first observation. And that is what I'll call the death of Milton Friedman's view of the firm, which is happening across corporations, not just in big tech. What do I mean by that? Well, as a good University of Chicago law and economics conservative, I subscribed and most of corporate America subscribed for a long time to Milton Friedman's shareholder primacy view of the firm, which essentially meant corporations exist to make money. Their job is to maximize profits for their shareholders. Their job is not to weigh in on public issues of the day, to discriminate against particular viewpoints, to alienate a big chunk of their customers. That's not what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to make the most money possible. And then through dividends and share buybacks, they can return money to shareholders and shareholders can support whatever liberal or conservative or libertarian causes that they want. And similarly, through very generous CEO stock option plans and pay packages, the CEO of a company can support whatever cause he or she wants, but they're not supposed to use the corporation itself and shareholder wealth as the basis for promoting those sorts of causes. And seemingly overnight, shareholder primacy has, I think, given way to what a lot of people are now calling stakeholder primacy. And it involves you know, Justice O'Connor's dream, a multi-factor balancing test where officers and directors of companies are supposed to think about shareholders. Yep, profits are still important, but you have to balance that against the competing interests of employees and then balance that against the competing interests of customers. And then my favorite one, balance that against the competing interests of society writ large which basically means when you throw all of these things into the balance, and of course, no factor is dispositive and it's not an exhaustive test, the decision maker can do whatever he or she wants with other people's money and support whatever causes they want, regardless of the consequences. And so this sort of stakeholder activism, I think has given way to a lot of things that we conservatives in the Federalist Society don't like, like the CEOs of Delta and Coca-Cola weighing in to virtue signal about the Georgia election laws, the next coming of Jim Crow, even though they clearly didn't read the law and didn't pay attention to the fact that tons of their customers probably agree with a wide swath of the provisions in that legislation. But more importantly, for purposes of big tech, who are in the market of controlling access to information points, they now feel completely unshackled to say, shareholders be damned, we don't care if canceling a particular idea or viewpoint or form of content actually reduces the bottom line, we're gonna engage in that behavior anyway because we think that it's good for society writ large. And in this multi-factor balancing test, we can basically do whatever we want. And so deplatforming Donald Trump which clearly is not a good decision from a shareholder wealth maximization perspective. The number of people who viewed his tweets, love him or hate them, were vastly exceeding the number of people who wouldn't come onto Twitter at all because they had a moral objection to the fact that the former president was allowed to tweet on that platform. There's no way you could do the cost benefit 
and say that deplatforming the president was good for the bottom line for shareholders, but the CEO of Twitter did it anyway because of this new stakeholder activism. And that closely relates to the third observation that I think creates a huge problem associated with big tech and public discourse, which is you're not seeing random cancellation of certain viewpoints taking this new power created by stakeholder activism. We all know that big tech is mostly in Silicon Valley. It's composed of younger executives compared to other industries. It just naturally lends itself to that. There's a cultural divide and a generational divide on principles of free speech and free expression and the marketplace of ideas. We all know about the woke paradigm that we find ourselves in where particularly younger people don't subscribe to the old, you know, your grandfather's ACLU or Alan Dershowitz style of liberalism where they say, I may not agree with what you have to say, but I'll fight to the death for your right to say it. No, to the contrary. They think that ideas can be violence. They think that words can be violence. They think that avoiding hurt feelings is extremely important and they have a moral imperative to support overwhelmingly liberal viewpoints. And so instead of a random cancellation of viewpoints by big tech wielding the power of stakeholder uh, primacy, which would be a problem in itself, it's all pointing in one direction. They are canceling one set of viewpoints, conservative viewpoints. And I plead guilty to being a conservative. And so I'm particularly alarmed that my side faces higher costs to getting our viewpoints out into the marketplace or are unable to get certain viewpoints out entirely on these platforms. But I'd like to think that I'm principled enough and that Federalist Society members are principled enough that in some alternative reality, if the roles were reversed and big tech were dominated by conservatives who wanted to cancel liberal viewpoints, we would still be extremely alarmed at the situation. And the reason for that to, to wax on about some ideas that I think we all believe in, at least from an older generation, the animating principles of the First Amendment are extremely important for a Republican form of government. And I recognize, of course, as Justice Thomas did, that technically the First Amendment only applies to government regulation of speech. And so I'm not saying that big tech is violating the First Amendment as a matter of law, but they are certainly violating the principles that animate the First Amendment. A marketplace of ideas, a vigorous exchange of views. This is the lifeblood of Republican government so that an informed citizenry can make decisions for themselves about the policies that they want to support and the leaders that they want to vote for that can implement those policies. And so stifling only one side of the debate is deeply problematic, which sort of then leads to the next question that's posed, which is, is there a role for antitrust enforcement in promoting a wider range of platform options for public discussion and debate? Yes, there is. Uh, I vigorously support using antitrust law to change this paradigm so that big tech doesn't have the monopolistic control on ideas and the ability to stifle conservative viewpoints. Like Dina, I think that you can use just traditional antitrust principles in order to get there. And John touched on this in his remarks as well, but the primary argument against traditional antitrust tools to break up big tech to take away their market power is, oh, well, they're providing the products for free. And so there can't possibly be any consumer harm. And again, echoing some of the points that Dina and John already remarked on, I just don't think that that makes any sense. These are multi-trillion dollar companies. They're obviously not providing things to you for free. They are competing for your attention and your data, which they then monetize. And it's not always as easy as John pointed out to monetize data. Data by itself is not money. You have to convert it into money, but they're pretty good at doing that. That's why they support the market capitalizations they do. And so you can throw that into the economic analysis and you can use their own documents to tell you how much they value your data at. They have precisely calculated how they're able to monetize your eyeballs and your information that you give them. And so using that in the traditional antitrust framework, I think is perfectly appropriate as a way to achieve a solution to the problem that I perceive, which is that they're engaging in flagrant viewpoint discrimination. But the more provocative point that I would make to close uh, and maybe use that as a good segue to get into Q and A is, even if you couldn't use the traditional tools of antitrust law, which only focus on economics uh, and consumer welfare as measured by dollars and cents, I would still say that judges like yourself, Judge Katzis, ought to innovate uh, and use the tools of the Sherman Antitrust 
Trust Act in order to achieve the important lowercase r Republican virtues and to reestablish a robust marketplace for ideas. And I know that we conservatives typically eschew the idea that judges ought to be making federal common law, but I think antitrust is a well-recognized exception to that rule because let's face it, the entire body of antitrust law is made up common law. Nobody actually thinks that all contracts and restraint of trade are unlawful because that would mean all contracts are unlawful. And so from the very beginning of the Sherman Act, it was courts who had to innovate and come up with the economic principles that would guide discussion for uh, what sort of corporate behavior was and was not prohibited by these very exiguous statutory schemes that Congress enacted in the 1800s. And given the shift in paradigm to where we are in this moment in time, and given that companies themselves are not strictly focused on economic principles because of the death of Milton Friedman's shareholder primacy view of the firm, I think it is totally appropriate for courts to take into account social welfare and the needs of lowercase r republicanism when they craft antitrust law and policy. And so to the extent that you have these corporations who are controlling the access points to all sorts of different viewpoints and preventing certain views, universally conservative views from getting out in the marketplace, even if you couldn't use traditional economic tools uh, and antitrust policies in order to stop that from continuing and from breaking them up, I would be fine with uh, judicial innovation being the mechanism to achieve the important policy objective of allowing all sorts of different views to flourish in the marketplace of ideas. Thank you. Um... on time, so let me invite the panelists to take maybe two to three minutes to um, respond to any comments of their co-panelists. Dina. Thank you, Judge. Um, John, I'll respond to a few of your comments. The first is that this is a, that this is a, you know, data and privacy. These are consumer protection issues. Um, I just say that consumer protection is a useful tool but I think that the free market does a better job making consumers happy and is the most powerful tool that we have to make sure that firms operate in the interests of consumers. And so I think for that reason, it's important that we defend competition where we need to, to, to reduce the regulatory burden, for example, from a consumer protection perspective. Um, another point I wanted to respond to is that people don't actually care about privacy. I agree that this is an empirical question and sort of my Facebook research was, was empirical research as to this question exactly. Um, I haven't seen research that suggests that consumers actually like to be tracked across the internet by singular firms. In fact, I'd point out that one of the largest market cap companies that we have in the world, Apple, has made privacy one of their primary forms of competition. And when they introduced the option for consumers to opt out of tracking recently, consumers are overwhelmingly selecting to opt out of being tracked by singular companies across third party sites. I'll also point out that when Facebook WhatsApp had, the, um, uh, had a data controversy a number of months ago, that consumers in trove switched to Signal, which was a competing app. And I think these are all examples of the, the market working. The, the last point that I'll respond to is that data doesn't to sort of translate into more revenue. When we're talking about ad markets, we're talking about really the largest real-time auction markets in the world. And data is a primary revenue driver in these real-time auction exchange markets. And you have a Google study here that says when you actually take um, data away from these real-time transactions that prices on exchanges can drop by 50%, and this is why these firms in their SEC filings and their 10K filings report revenue on an average revenue per user basis. Thank you, Judge. John. Yeah, um, no, I actually agree with the points that Dina raised. Um, you know, I, I do think that data 
is more of an opportunity. Now, I, I agree. I think data does translate ultimately into revenue. Uh, the point being is that um, inputs ultimately result in output, and but that doesn't happen without some degree of effort, skill, and competition. And so translating data into revenue better than your competitor is a point of competition and is something that uh, I think we generally uh, encourage, such as uh, IP and other types of innovation. We would think those are dimensions in which you can compete and create better products. Now, there's an argument, does data result in better products? You know, if we focus overtly on the targeting across uh, sites, and, and certainly there are aspects of data that I think make us all a little creeped out, uh, but there are other aspects of data that are important in terms of the delivery of certain types of services and the consumer welfare that can come from those types of services. So it's not an either or question. There certainly can be data used in very good ways as well as very bad ways as well. So yeah, I agree on, on that sort of dimension. And so um, I'm also for less regulation and for markets working, uh, but there can be market failures. And I think there are some real questions about information asymmetries in privacy that is not uh, correlated with market power, but rather correlated with just the nature of these types of markets, whether you have big or small share, consumers have a very difficult time understanding precisely what data is being used and tracked. And if data is being represented in one way, Dina mentioned Facebook was misrepresenting their data. I'm all for bringing cases on those types of issues because those seem to me a, a representation issue rather than competition per se. Um, perhaps they're correlated in some way. Uh, but the idea is that I still think that we should uh, consider perhaps there's some information problems in a race to the bottom. And I'm not saying regulation is the solution. Sometimes that creates more problems than it fixes. But um, this could be something that goes across markets. And so uh, the point uh, I'm at is it's not that I, I think anyone's that there's great pri privacy policies throughout the Internet. There's clearly bad policies everywhere. And the question is, how do we get it? And I think an overt fo focus on market power, maybe we miss uh, the larger picture and we're gonna fix something that doesn't quite get the job done. And so that's my purpose. It's not that um, I think that, that everything is, is going great. I, I'd love to see less tracking across the internet and, and, um, and sort of more transparency. Uh, the question is, how do we get there? And obviously there's some, some, you know, uh, some, some alternative approaches and it's important to debate those. So with that, I know I'm, I'm going over, but um, thanks for the comments, Dina. Oh, you're fine. Ashley. Yeah, I'm a little bit more focused on the free speech issues as opposed to the data monetization issues. So I mostly agree with Dina and John on sort of the economic points, but uh, I will just say that it has gone unrebutted that Milton Friedman is no longer uh, the sort of dominant force in how corporations behave. And I think that has all sorts of implications. I take a backseat to no one in my love for the late great Bob Bork. Uh, I love the antitrust paradox. I love all of his other writings too. Um, and he's part of the reason that I went into law, but the entire paradigm has shifted if corporations are no longer focused exclusively on maximizing the bottom lines and market efficiency and all sorts of theories have to be reevaluated if that's true. Okay, uh, we have some time for questions. Um, let's start with the more conventional antitrust framework and then move up to your, your political and viewpoint issues, Ashley. Um, so Dina, if, if we accept that the platforms have monopoly power and that they are basically charging consumers instead of charging them dollars, they're charging them privacy costs. Um, and Facebook, now that it's a monopolist, can charge a higher cost than it otherwise could by demanding more information. Um, even if all of that is true, do, does that, wh why doesn't that amount to just Facebook is effectively charging the monopoly price in privacy terms as opposed to a competitive market price. And if you're a monopolist, you get to charge a monopoly price. That's not in and of itself predatory conduct. Thank you, Judge. I think that the big question there um, goes to the tactics that Facebook 
use to monopolize the market in the first place to be able to charge those monopoly rents. And um, I think this story, again, tells, is one of, uh, is one where Facebook engaged in a pattern and practice of deception when it came to data and privacy or the, over the course of about 10 years that allowed consumers and drove consumers to tip the market in Facebook's favor. And I, I think that's what the problematic conduct is with Facebook in particular. Which is also right. what, what makes it predatory as well. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay, um, Ashley, on the broader um, themes, um, one case that came to mind as I was thinking about this um, in terms of the political issues and viewpoint discrimination and such um, is Claiborne Hardware, which says that in a section one context, conduct that would otherwise violate the antitrust laws like a group boycott, if it's done to achieve a political agenda, A, section one doesn't cover it, and B, if section one did cover it, there would be First Amendment problems. Is there any constraint under section two along the same lines, which is to say, um, yeah, um, Facebook has a political agenda, but they get to have a political agenda, right? Corporations are persons for First Amendment purposes. Jack Dorsey's a person. If he wants to um, restrict trade for some political agenda, that's not a concern of the antitrust law, or if it were, um, the First Amendment would allow him to do that. Yeah, that, that's a fair question. Uh, we can go back to original public meeting and whether corporations should be considered persons for First Amendment purposes, but uh, we'll, we'll leave that where it is and, and take the existing jurisprudence as it stands. I think the problem with that analysis here is that Jack has a monopoly over the flow of information, which is the thing that the First Amendment is obviously designed to protect. And so while, of course, as a private citizen, he has First Amendment rights, just like every other private citizen, and indeed corporations themselves outside of the monopoly context, and maybe even outside of the monopoly context for information, might have First Amendment rights to engage in political advocacy of their choice, when the political advocacy is by a monopolist that wants to ensure that there can be no political advocacy for the other side of the debate. And therefore that other side of the debate can't get their views out. It would seem to me a distortion of the first amendment rather than a vindication of it to say that the first amendment protects their right to do that. Anybody else? Okay, um, let's see, I'm just looking through questions here. Um, John, I think you said that we should um, focus on consumer protection laws um, in addition to antitrust. Do you have any concerns about using antitrust qua antitrust with um, over-regulating you know, the, the standard account that there's a fine line between competition on the merits and predatory conduct, and you can really use the antitrust laws to undercut their goals if you're not careful about distinguishing the two? Yeah, no, it's, that's the fundamental issue. Um, you know, your question to Dina, Judge, was about that issue of uh, the difference between extraction and, ex and extension. You know, there's a good paradigm in antitrust that it, um, extraction is legal, right? We want to create that incentive for firms to innovate and to win on the merits. And if they do, while it's not great for consumers, perhaps, that dynamic process of the innovation of winning and trying to win and that competition results ultimately in a better outcome, even if we're willing to accept some degree of static inefficiency based off of that. But then the question is, as you raise, and as Dina mentioned, did we get there uh, in a way that wasn't legitimate, that 
because the nature of these types of markets, it's harder to see, right? When we see a group boycott or a collusion or a merger that was really anti-competitive, that's a little cleaner to see how they got there if it was illegitimate. But uh, what if they engage in certain types of privacy practices that ultimately got them more data in a way that, as Dina mentioned, was deceptive, and then that sort of got the ball rolling and that tips the market in a certain direction towards um, dominance in that area. And as a theory, that's completely plausible and fine. The question is, is did they engage in that? And if there is evidence, then that's something of value. And that's where the intersection of consumer welfare, uh, consumer protection, excuse me, and antitrust can play together actually quite well. Um, then there's a the question of does data in of itself explain the tipping or was it something quite different? Uh, I mean, it's easy to point to data and the size of data for the success, but, but is that, you know, correlation or causation? And, you know, is this just a result of their size? Uh, you know, there's probably a truth to both, but there's a lot of things that account for a platform success. And so one of the things I would just, uh, case by case, it could be quite true, but uh, as a presumption, I think there's a, a sort of a tendency to, to think that it is the data that explains it in pretty much all these types of markets. And that's just something that I, I feel like there should be some caution with is that, you know, some of this conduct uh, could be legitimate mixed with illegitimate. And it's often hard to figure it out. And so just moving to data as the reason for misbehavior can be a little bit misleading. Anybody else? Ashley, how would you, um, how would you operationalize this broader view of what's at issue here, right? V viewpoint based discrimination um, against political speech as opposed to um, you know, monopoly leveraging or the, the more conventional theories in the case. Would, would you use the markets that are that seem to be defined in these cases like, whatever, a market for internet search services, or would you try to recast the relevant market as one in political ideas, which seems to be the, the motivating cause for the broader concern, but maybe less obvious as an antitrust concept? Yeah, I don't think I want so much tinkering. I've already proposed quite a bit. Um, so I think I would stick with the conventional framework of antitrust law for market definitions. And I would stick with the idea that you have to show that they obtained market power, not just through building a better mousetrap, but through anti-competitive harms along the way, such as the deceptive trade practices that Dina and John were just talking about. The main event for me would be in the remedies and considering the ultimate harm to consumers as a result of the anti-competitive conduct. I'm obviously invested in it. You pointed out at the beginning that uh, I'm proud to represent Texas and other states in our antitrust case against Google. So I feel, I feel strongly that big tech hasn't just obtained their monopolies honestly, but have engaged in anti-competitive behavior. I think you could go through the conventional antitrust analysis to get to the point where now a judicial officer has to craft a remedy. And I think in crafting a remedy, particularly equitable ones, it's totally appropriate to take into account not just the economic harms associated with the monopolist behavior, but the societal harms associated with this unique industry where again, we're talking about viewpoint discrimination, the marketplace of ideas and sort of foundational principles for Republican government. Suppose there were no, um deception or bait and switch or, or classic exclusionary conduct. And you just had a platform with monopoly power openly saying, um, we, for our own reasons, don't want whatever, Republican speech. Would, would that in and of itself be exclusionary conduct under section two? Certainly not as conventionally understood. I think that would be just as dangerous for the fabric of American society as what I think exists right now. At that point, I'm not sure the antitrust laws are the right tool to fix the problem. Maybe they would be. Um, I think it would be harder to get consensus for that, but I'd still favor the exact same outcome, just perhaps through a different policy vehicle. Congress should act. Delaware should mandate Milton Friedman's model. 
uh, as part of its corporate structure for corporations incorporated there or some other such solution, but I'd be looking to achieve the exact same thing, which is not having a monopolist stifle one side of a debate. Okay, um, another question that's come in, this may not be directly relevant to antitrust, but let me try to um, connect it up that way, which is one question that we've talked about across all these panels is how to think about you know, who, who, who are the speakers here? Um, is, is Facebook or, or Twitter the, a, a speaker that we care most about or um, do we care more about individual consumers who use the platform? And maybe one way to frame that question in antitrust terms, this may go back to how you think of the markets, is Facebook a, um, is Facebook a supplier in something like a, a market for access to a network or should we think of them for some purposes as also a participant in a market for speech? They like to say, they like to analogize themselves to newspapers who curate and make editorial judgments and such, or is it a combination? Or is that just not an antitrust question at all? Who's that for, Judge? Whoever wants. Could. Uh, I'll take a quick stab. I think that defining their participation in the product and service that they offer is obviously an antitrust concern and goes to the definition of the market. I think that we shouldn't care whether they're speaking or consumers are speaking or corporations are speaking through their platform. All speech uh, should be allowed to, to sort of proliferate and in a marketplace of ideas, consumers can decide for themselves. Consumers of speech can decide what they wanna to listen to and what resonates with them. I think it's unquestionable that when they engage in censorship or curating to use the more neutral term that, that you just did, that's them doing the speaking or at least part of the speaking. And when they put warnings associated with particular viewpoints and messages saying this isn't true and hasn't been fact-checked and uh, everything about this is wrong, you can only see the speech if you click here and recognize that we've already told you that this is bad speech, that's them doing the speaking. And so I think it's a mix of both where they're the distributor of speech, but they're also speakers in the marketplace themselves. Okay, we um, are nearing the end of our time. So John, any final thoughts? No, I don't. I, thank you for, for having me, Judge, and, and for the Federalist Society and to the fellow panelists. I really enjoyed it. Dina, any final thoughts? No final thoughts. And I echo John, thank you for having me. It's been really fun. Okay. Alita, we, are you there? We managed to finish almost on time this time. Sorry, sorry about that. Yes, um, thanks everybody for, um, for, for participating in this. It was, um, I think this was a great event. Um, really appreciate everybody's contribution and everyone for, for joining us. Um, we invite um, participant feedback um, at our um, um, info at fedsoc.org email. Please everybody join us for next week's discussion when we'll be considering the relative merits of federal preemption and state level innovation. Um, remember to fill in your CLE if necessary. Um, Look forward to seeing everybody again soon. Thanks for joining us. We're adjourned.